Thank you, Prue. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, the Ngunnawal peoples. I pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and I bring greetings from my people, the Kwandamooka peoples, as Prue said, from Indiriba, or North Shrebrooke Island, as you may know, just off the coast of Brisbane. Um, and I'd also like to just apologise, I'm just recovering from a bit of a head cold over the last week and a bout of food poisoning last night, so if uh, <laughs> things are a little bit sketchy, <laughs> and I have to duck out quickly, um, just, just excuse me for a moment. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Prue, uh, Brian and Stella and the team from Families Australia for the opportunity um, to be here today and speak with you about the Uluru Statement from the Heart, something that I'm very passionate about. What it might mean for the work that you do with your organisations and the people that you work with and the people that you work in service of. Um, I'll just very quickly give you a bit of a bit of a background about my involvement. So Prue said my, my day job is investment analyst and it's something I'm still getting used to. It's a, an interesting move for me. I've, I've been more involved in the Indigenous development space over, over a number of years. Um, and had the opportunity to, to, to move into the, to the finance community, the investment community, um, through a friend and mentor of mine, John Wiley, um, with the view that one of the big spaces where there are no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices is in the financial sector. Um, and everybody's talking about economic development as being one of the big levers for change in Indigenous communities. And in my experience in working in that space, there aren't enough of our own mob that are in there helping work with their own community. So part of the hypothesis, if you like, for setting down um, my career in Indigenous development and, and moving into the investment space and working in a private equity team um, is to develop those skills and hopefully be able to engage those and employ those back in the, in the space where we can really affect some change. So um, I'm speaking you, to you today with my uh, Uluru Statement Advocacy hat on. Don't ask me for any financial advice, you will only go very, very wrong. Um, oh, I hope to get better, but yeah, at this age. Um, just in terms of my experience with the Uluru Statement uh, from the heart, I was uh, very, very privileged and lucky to be asked to work with Arnie Pat Anderson, uh, Professor Megan Davis and Noel Pearson as the Referendum Council set out to to really pose this question about what meaningful constitutional recognition looked like to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And that was back in the sort of middle part of 2016. So working with those three and other significant leaders around the country, I co-facilitated a number of trial and, and uh, sort of design workshops before the process started. I co-facilitated every single one of the regional dialogues around the country, um, stood at the front of every single room and heard everything that our mob was saying that, that was important to them, not just about constitutional recognition, but the other structural reforms that the Uluru Statement also speaks to. I also co-facilitated the uh, Uluru Convention um, in May 2017. Had the great privilege of putting my signature next to some of the giants of our community, um, both at national policy reform levels, but also at the community and what we call grassroots levels, um, community members as well. Um, and that was the beauty of the Uluru Statement, is that it, it certainly wasn't conceived by a bunch of people in a room somewhere. Having stood at the front of the room and listened to everything that people had to say, I can genuinely attest to say that the 430 words of nation building that the Uluru Statement has come up with is genuinely not just from that 12 month process, but as I'll talk about later on, this is a continuum of, of a conversation that's been going on for many, many decades and, and will continue to. Um, the opportunity for us now is to, is to change that conversation, to change that narrative and genuinely make the changes we need to see. Um, the other point I'll, I'll make at the, at the outset is that none of us would have embarked down this route of constitutional reform if we didn't think it was gonna have an impact on the real lives of people in our communities. This isn't some sort of abstract, esoteric process that a bunch of elites uh, are getting their jollies out of by, you know, by, by playing on the national stage. This is genuine reform. Um, this is addressing genuine need, addressing genuine cries for help and change from people on the ground, and, and the Uluru Statement absolutely speaks to that. Um, 
I also want to reference the work that you guys do, um, and and particularly the work that Richard and the team do at Family Matters and Snake, and, and the work that um, is affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their families. I'll, in doing so, I want to make a couple of declarations. I'm not an expert in this space, um, so the real experts are people like Richard and the people that work in the organisations and on the ground, um, so I'm not going to pretend to uh, draw links where they don't exist or cause and effects and solutions where they don't exist. Um, I always say there's no silver bullets in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander policy. It's far too complex for that. And I think a fact that's underestimated far too often, particularly in government and particularly in politics. Um, but certainly the reforms contained within the Uluru Statement are a big part of that picture and as I say, are a continuum of, of things that have been advocated for for many years. And I also want to reference the, uh, the Family Matters report that was released last Thursday, I believe. Um, and, and also, as, and to that point, acknowledge that the first line in that report is that this space is complex. And uh, I want to acknowledge that complexity. Um, one of the things I'd like to do first is, is congratulate Richard and Natalie and the Family Matters campaign and all of the organisations that sit behind that campaign for the report that they've released. Um, I read a lot of reports, as obviously you guys do yourselves. Um, I find there's a lot of platitudes, a lot of bureaucratic language, um, and a lot of words being written without saying very much. Um, congratulate Richard and Natalie and the team for the report that they put out last week. In the clarity of its logic, and the unavoidable truth of the facts that they put out, the report was clearly written with great heart as well, not just not just a statistical analysis of the problem, but a recognition that we're talking about our people. And that came through very, very strongly in the report and the authority that those people and the authors of that report put to it was, again, unavoidable. So I want to congratulate them for, for a remarkable report. In, in saying that, um, the content of the report is absolutely devastating. Um, the statistics, uh, it's... it's for someone that reads a lot of these things and really reads a lot of about this Indigenous disadvantage, two things happen. One, you get a little bit, you skim over the statistics because you keep hearing the same thing all the time. But part of that's a protective mechanism as well because there's trauma about listening to and being constantly bombarded with these numbers, with these numbers of, of disadvantage and the, and the, and the human toll that's, that's, that's coming as a result of what sits behind those um, statistics. So um, you have, there's a risk sometimes that we get a little bit of new and a little bit desensitised to them, but there were two in particular that really struck out at me in this report. The, the first was the headline statistic, and that is that in the next 10 years, unchecked, without any reform, without any ways of doing things differently to what we're doing now, the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care will double in the next 10 years. So we'll go from about 20,000 out to 40,000 in 10 years. That's off the back of a doubling since the historic apology to the stolen generations by Prime Minister Rudd in 2008. So just sitting back for a second with that particular statistic and understanding what that means, not just for those children, not just for their families, but their communities over a lifetime and the impacts that that is going to have in a ripple effect and the reverberations that that will happen not just in Indigenous communities, but the mainstream community as well, is, is, is something that makes me very, very sad. It makes me quite angry. And uh, it feels like that it's that sort of statistic, that sort of fact that should be shaking people out of any sense of complacency that sits there right now. Um, the second fact that really um, struck, struck out at me, and it was, a, it was a reference to a report, some research done uh, previously, which was that, uh, uh, a third of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country are living below the poverty line. And again, that was something that made me sit up. That is an absolutely staggering number of people that are living in poverty in this country. We don't often talk about class in Australia. In fact, any time we talk about class, it is often co-opted and, and there's, a, there's a thing that's put on the end, which is warfare. As if, as if this is an attack on, on just the upper and in doing so and in avoiding that conversation, we're not having genuine conversations about poverty in this country and the impacts that that is happening. And the report itself, 
obviously it makes a link to the stresses that um, people living with and in poverty and the effect that that has on their families and then the effect that that has on their children and the propensity of those children then to engage with the uh, child protection system is unavoidable. And the thing that also relates to in that report is that the report says too much of the effort, and this is something you will all be well aware of, too much of the effort, too much of the, the narrative at the moment is focused at the back end of the system. It's focused at once the children have entered and are being processed and there's right conversations about making sure that the interests of the children are absolutely prioritised and put at the forefront of everything we do. But that's where the focus is, totally at that focus. And we have departments for child protection um, because we need, we need systems to focus on how we deal with that at that end. But there is no department for poverty. Um, and while we, there is no minister responsible for, for poverty, and while we continue to focus on that end of the spectrum, knowing that a third of people are living in poverty, all that end of that system is going to do is become a better funnel for the kids that pop out the other end. We're not going to be doing the necessary work that needs to happen at the front end, um, looking at the strengths of, of our families and our children, looking at what is it that we can do to support them to make sure that the children don't enter the system in the first place. So they were two of the, the key statistics that stuck out for me and that theme of focusing at the wrong end of the system. And, and the last thing that really struck out for me in that, in that, uh, in that report was the, the, the continued and emphatic calls for empowerment and self-determination. That we need to empower our organisations, we need to empower our families, we need to empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people where they live so that they can start to take control over their own affairs. And I, re and I read that report, and I want to congratulate uh, the team again for reintroducing the language of self-determination. And as I'll talk, talk about in a, in a second, uh, that language has disappeared from the policy vernacular since the mid-2000s. It, it just, we were talking about it and then it disappeared off the cliff. And that has profound implications for what we think the key changes that need to happen in our communities. Um, so this, 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 this call for um, empowerment and self-determination was stark and was, was all the way through. It's one of the building blocks um, for family matters. It's, it's one of the key priorities, obviously, that's needed to help uh, shift the dial. And it reminded me of the conversations, the many conversations that I had with um, some of the older people over that period working on the Uluru Statement, working on the Referendum Council Dialogues. People like Uncle Solly Belair, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, a man who dedicated his life to his beloved Redfern community and, and a national and international um, scale uh, in his very gentle way. You know, as, as a younger guy, I got to literally sit at the knee of these people and listen to them and, and, and hear their stories about the changes that they've been advocating for for many, many years. And this, this concept of empowerment and self-determination is omnipresent in everything that we say and do. And the calls continue to be unheard. The call continues to be dismissed in favour of some other prescription. And what I, want, what, what I want to do is just, I'm going to, if you just bear with me for a second, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read through a number of statements that have been made in the last 30 years, I'm going to start with one Royal Commission. I'm going to start with the Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody. And I'm going to finish with the Royal Commission into uh, Child Protection and Youth Detention in the Northern Territory in 2017. And I want, to hear, I want you to listen to the words that are being spoken about throughout these reports. And then I'm going to read to you the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Because there's been a lot of commentary that says, well, the Uluru Statement is a new idea, it's a new concept. The only people that can say that are the people that have never understood their own history, that have never understood that, that this is just a continuum of advocacy and activism that has spanned many, many decades. So I'm just going to read through these um, statements briefly and then I'll, then I'll read to you the earlier statement. So I'll start with the Royal Commission in 1991, the Royal Commission of Deaths and Custody. The thrust of this report is that the elimination of disadvantage requires an end of domination and an empowerment of Aboriginal people. 
that control of their lives, of their communities, must be returned to Aboriginal hands. In 1992, the first report of ATSIC, the crucial importance of self-determination to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is little appreciated by non-Indigenous Australians. Correctly understood, every issue concerning the historical and present status, entitlements, treatment and aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is implicated in the concept of self-determination. The reason for this lies in the fact that self-determination is a process. The right of self-determination is the right to make decisions. These decisions affect the enjoyment and exercise of the full range of freedoms and human rights of Indigenous peoples. This is the one government report that I pulled out. This was a 1992 COAG um, statement on the national commitment to improve the outcomes and the delivery of programs and services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Guiding principle one, empowerment, self-determination and self-management by Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islanders. 1995, in writing the foreword to the Recognition and Rights and Reform Report, the Social Justice Package, Uncle Charlie Perkins said, our focus is on institutional, structural, collaborative, cooperative reform. It is about a fundamental shift from welfare to basic rights, from dependence to autonomy, from government assistance to power. Central to the social justice agenda is self-determination. Bringing Them Home report in 1997. Our principal finding is that self-determination for Indigenous peoples provides the key to reversing the over-representation of Indigenous children in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems of the states and territories and to enabling unjustified removals of Indigenous children from their families and communities. The 2007 Little Children Are Sacred report by Arnie Pat Anderson, who was one of the co-authors to this, and Rex Wild QC. I just want to make a point. One of the saddest things I saw in the whole process leading to the Uluru Statement from the Heart was Arnie Pat standing up at the Ross River Dialogue, which is about 100 kilometres east of Alice Springs. So this is the, these are the mobs that were ground zero. Mutajulu, ground zero for the Northern Territory intervention. And Arnie Pat gets at the front of the room, and she stands there, and she apologises to that group. She apologises for the role that she played in the Northern Territory intervention. You know, this old woman who did the hardest of the hard jobs in listening to those stories and crafting the Little Children of Sacred Report in good faith. Um, the fact that that report was then taken and without any engagement, without any further engagement with Arnie Pat or the people that authored that report, was used to justify the Northern Territory intervention. Arnie Pat felt right that she should stand up and apologise to those people. <coughs> now, in their graciousness, they knew it wasn't her fault. They knew that she wasn't the one that led to the intervention. But it was uh, it was something I'll never forget to, 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 to watch somebody who has been a warrior for our people um, to feel that she had to apologise for the horrible um, things that have happened in their communities. So from the Little Children of Sacred Report, what is required is a determined, coordinated effort to break the cycle and provide the necessary strength, power and appropriate support and services to local communities so they can lead themselves out of the malaise. In a word, empowerment. The 2014 Empowered Communities Report, which I was heavily involved in working with leaders from eight regions across the country. In. Empowerment in our meaning has two aspects. It means Indigenous people empowering ourselves by taking all appropriate and necessary powers and responsibilities for our own lives and futures. It also means Commonwealth, State and Territory governments sharing and in some cases relinquishing certain powers and responsibilities and supporting Indigenous people with resources and capability building. And then finally, from one Royal Commission to another in 2017, which was being run in concert at the same time as the Uluru Statement was being uh, crafted. Despite constant recommendations calling for the inclusion of Aboriginal people and communities, governments have not allowed or empowered Aboriginal people to lead in decision making. Engagement and consultation are often given lip service and that, but have no practical impact on outcomes. So you cannot accuse us of not being consistent in our calls 
for empowerment <coughs> and self-determination for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and yet those calls go unheard. They go unresponded to. So I'm going to read to you now the Uluru Statement, and with what I've just said in mind and knowing that that is just three decades of this advocacy, that is the last five minutes compared to how long we've been talking about these things. I'll read to you the Uluru Statement and listen to those, these words, and hopefully you will come to your own conclusions about why Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people landed on what we did through the Uluru Statement. We, gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands, and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did, according to the reckoning of our culture, from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise? That peoples possessed the land for the last 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda. They're coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967 we were counted. In 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and embark. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. So you can see that the Uluru statement comes from a heritage, not just a cultural heritage but it comes from a heritage of policy and political activism that has spanned many, many decades. And it is absolutely no surprise that when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were given the opportunity to say what meaningful constitutional recognition looked like to them, they didn't go for symbolism by itself. They didn't go for minimalism. They didn't go for a set of poetry poetic words to be inserted in the Constitution to make the rest of the country feel better about itself? Nope. They went for reform, structural reform, off the back of a need that has been articulated for too many years. 
the Uluru Statement does a couple of things. Um, and, and related to that point, um, you know, this process for constitutional recognition has been banging on for about 15 years in its kind of concerted form. There's been many uh, calls for empowerment self-determination, as I've said, in, in various different ways and for Indigenous people to be played into the power structures of this nation. But, but really it's been about the last 10 to 15 years the focus has been on Indigenous constitutional recognition. And at the back end of that process, someone suddenly decided, well, geez, we should probably ask the blackfellas what they think um, <laughs> about what constitutional reform uh, should look like to them because we'd have, you know, I think the number's about eight or nine now, expert panels, parliamentary committees, inquiries, whatever you, whatever you want to call them. And then they said, all right, we'll, we'll, put, it, we'll put it to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander the people. And the real, this really interesting thing happened. From, from a conversation for the last 10 years that's focused on the question of how do we recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution, that was the level of the conversation and all the investigations. The Uluru Statement says, nah, it's not about that. This is about nationhood. This is about nation building. It shifts the conversation, it raises the level of the conversation and says, actually, if we get this right, this isn't about closing the gap. We get this right, we are going to have a fuller expression of, a, of Australia's nationhood, an expression that has Indigenous peoples, First Nations, their language, their culture and their heritage at the core of an Australian identity. That's something that absolutely everyone can speak to and it's the very reason why the Uluru Statement was never submitted as a proposal to governments. It's the very reason why it was written to you, the people of Australia. Because this isn't just about blackfellas. Yeah, no, we've got, to, we've got to do some work and we've got to carve out a place of power and influence for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people so we can shift the dial on some of these issues in a very pragmatic sense. But ultimately, the outcome will be a, a nation more comfortable with itself and its history and a nation that has a strong ownership and a strong sense of Indigenous peoples at, its, at the core of its identity, and that's a prize that everybody, every Australian who feels inspired by that should be fighting for. This isn't just a, this isn't just a cause, this isn't just a movement by Aboriginal people, for Aboriginal people. This is, a, this is an Australian movement, and that's why it's incumbent upon every single one of you as individuals to determine what your response to that invitation is going to be. You actually can't sit back and wait for the government to issue a yes or a no. It's on you. So that's a, a, a different take, I think, than what many people have understood the Uluru Statement is. Um, and I just want to speak to another point about um, there's been a recent, since the Uluru Statement was issued, there's been a false distinction made between practical and symbolism. And it's been deliberate. It's been deliberate. Um, and, it's, and it's to say, well, constitutional recognition sits firmly in the symbolism bit, then, well, that's good, but that's not going to keep children at home and what we've got to focus on the, on the practical. Well, two things. If you understand this document to not be a symbolic request, it is actually nation building. Nation building needs both. You need to move the hearts and the minds. It is about the hard-headed realities of the changes that we need to make, but also about shifting how we think about ourselves as a country. So you can't disassociate them from the Uluru Statement. You can't say it's practical or symbolic. It is necessarily both. And symbols are important. I can tell you when the statement was written, less than two days after the statement was launched, we had the nonsense of the Third Chamber being thrown out there in, in the political um, spectrum. And so you have the situation where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, in, 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 a, in an act of graciousness and good faith, having wrestled with these issues for, for many, many years, the most marginalised, dispossessed people in this country probably had every right to come up with a shopping, shopping list of grievances and a, and a statement of claim as a result of the Uluru Statement. Instead, they came out with a statement of nation building for everybody and stood there with hand extended to governments and the people of Australia and said, we, we want to do this with you. And that hand got slapped away in two days um, with the nonsense of the third chamber. I can tell you symbols are important. 
And we're going to know more about that next year in the 250th anniversary of the Cook uh, landing. Um, there is literally going to be a symbol of the First Nations original disposition being sailed around the coastline that's being dressed up as, a, as an act of reconciliation that will be good for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to participate in. I can tell you that will be a very, very powerful symbol that will be sailing around our shores next year. Um, so it is important that we get the symbolism right. But the practical side of it is unavoidable. Every single one of those reports that I referenced before and those that came before them, and I can tell you right now, I know what the number one recommendation of the next report that's going to be written is going to say. Empowerment and self-determination. Organisations and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It's already written there. Um, and it is the one practical policy lever that governments of both sides have refused to pull. Have refused to pull genuine efforts at genuine empowerment, capacity building of organisations and individuals and, and efforts to genuinely drive towards self-determination. It is a practical, it is the most practical tool that's available to us that hasn't been used yet. So Uluru's statement is both. It is both practical and symbolic. And, uh, and it is right to hold those two things together. Um, so where are we now? Uh, we're, we're, in a, we're in a pretty tricky, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to two, I'll talk to two um, elements of where we are now. Sorry, time, all right? No. Um, uh, I'll talk to the politics and I'll talk to the people's movement because they're two different things. Um, and the people are out in front. Um, but I'll talk to the politics. Uh, we're in, a, as I said, we're in a very difficult situation right now. Um, I've been thinking quite a lot about how to say this properly. <laughs> Just say it. Just say it. Yeah. Turn the videos off now. <laughs> no. Um, look. Uh, the, the 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 reality is we're 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 working um, with a, with a government that is clearly not in favour of pushing towards a referendum anytime soon, um, where the question is a First Nations voice. What the government has done, and the government was doing. But to be honest, I think they were they were flagging that they've been flagging this for quite some time, um, so we shouldn't be surprised. But there was a deliberate decoupling of the question of constitutional recognition and the question of a voice. It was it was it was pulled apart, and it was started to be pulled apart quite subtly at the beginning. And as soon as those words started coming separately, I was like, uh, that doesn't bode well for where we're going. Um, so where we are at the moment, and and I'll be really honest, it's quite hard to tell you exactly where we are. Uh, Minister Wyatt has been desperately disappointing on this issue. Uh, in some ways, we, we, we kind of need him to stop talking about it um, because every time he does, he sows more confusion. Um, and uh, we genuinely don't know where he, where he stands other than a hardening of the position. Um, so there's been various statements being made and, and, it, and again it takes a little over a day or two days before that position is unwound and refuted um, where all options are on the table we're gonna we're going to uh, even that in itself is a bit of a backtracking because the Uluru statement and the process that it went through the really really hard work that it did was filter through all of those options for constitutional reform and came out with one that's what had, had never been done before that all the options have been always on the table, section 51, racial non-discrimination, Uluru came out with one very clear statement, First Nations voice. Um, we moved away from that to say all options are back on the table. Two days after a press club speech, that was no longer the case. The voice was not on the table. Uh, the minister goes to Gama, um, surrounded by the goodwill of many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, genuinely willing him to do well um, knowing that he's in a very difficult situation, all options are back on the table. <laughs> Two weeks later, at the Lin Lin uh, Vincent Lingiari speech, categorically, there will be no voice um, enshrined in the Constitution, and that the question of constitutional recognition will be something else yet to be determined. Um, we have an interview last week which says uh, we will pursue, the government will pursue a legislated voice without the constitutional protection, and again, constitutional recognition will look like something else. Um, it is immensely frustrating uh, to know that uh, this process has been embarked upon in good faith. 
um, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and many of their supporters, I have to say, um, that are out there helping us beat the drum on this. And, uh, and at the moment, the government appears to refuse to entertain um, that as a fact. Um, the one uh, caveat I'll put on that yet is that we haven't had the official word. We have not yet had a prime ministerial statement or a cabinet decision that has said this is definitely the, the, the case. So we will not talk this into defeat before that happens. Um, and even if it is defeat, it is a momentary defeat um, because uh, we're not going to take no for an answer on this. And, 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 and there will be a very difficult conversation to be had if constitutional recognition is to take some other form. Um, that would be a willful dismissal of what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have already comprehensively rejected. Um, so uh, that's where we are on that piece. There's also a, a co-design process that's that's supposed to be announced relatively soon, which is to co-design um, the details of what a voice might look like. We've been accused of not having enough detail to describe what the voice would look like, so this process would be to, to flesh that out. That was always the intention. The Referendum Council's report said that the voice should be co-designed between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the Parliament, because the Parliament has to inter interact with this voice, so the Parliament should have a say. Um, it's taken us two years to get to that point, um, but um, but hopefully, you know, this co-design process will help us put some details on that bone, um, or meat on the bone, mashing metaphors. Um, <coughs> but uh, but uh, you know, we're not going to settle for a legislated voice. <coughs> Let me be very, 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 very clear. A legislated voice is not a win. It is a profound defeat. Um, once the voice is legislated, it will never be constitutionally enshrined. We know that for an absolute fact. Um, it will either be successful, which we hope it will be, in which case people will say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it stumbles in its first couple of years, <coughs> which it will as a startup, um, a, a, in a committee, an advisory a voice to the parliament, then that will, be, that will be used as a justification to not enshrine it. So we will be in a no-win situation if the voice is legislated, so we will be absolutely fighting to ensure that, um, in this case, we're not going to settle for, for a legislative voice. So the, the fight continues for us um, to, to ensure that this First Nations voice is, it has a constitutional protection. The lessons of the past are too stark for us to ignore. ATSIC, for all its flaws, and it had some, um, was in operation one day and the swipe of the ministerial pen, it was gone the next. And uh, when we're talking about intergenerational change, intergenerational reform, um, we can't live with that level of uncertainty. Uh, we need the ability to bring the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people closer to the decision-making centres in this country. And that is when we'll start to see a shift in some of these issues. I want to finish on a positive note, and it is genuinely positive. Because the Uluru Statement is a statement of hope. It's a statement of grand vision and hope. And there has been an organic, disparate, disorganised people's movement that has continued to grow since the Uluru Statement was uh, first released. It started with the um, social sector, ACOS and the like, um, got out really quickly the AMA and entities like that, the Australian Bar Association, got out in front and expressed their support. They understand, as you know, um, that this is a piece of genuine reform and that this is important to the work that they do. Corporate Australia has got on board, law firms, fund managers, investment companies, super funds, the advisory companies um, have all signed public statements of support since the election, when it was risky. I can, I can tell you, um, supporting the Uluru Statement is not a tick and flick exercise because uh, a bunch of companies issued a statement, a public statement of support. On a Saturday, the Prime Minister came out and basically said there will be no constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice. That Sunday, an editor from The Australian rang around the heads of those companies and said, the Prime Minister has knocked this on the head. Do you still support it? And to their credit, every single one of them was staunch in their support. Um, so there will be political pressure on organisations to support this. Um, 
and those that do know exactly what they're getting in for, but they stick with us in, in this movement. And the thing that's given me great heart is not just the companies, it's not just the institutions, the organisations, it's the little conversations. And I'm, in, I'm on these little Facebook groups and there's these little mull and billy sort of, you know, like little, little communities out and around the place and people going to the pub and listening to a speaker talk about the Uluru Statement and why that's important. And non-Indigenous people who feel connected to its message and feel connected to its hope are out there leading it. They're asking for help to um, give some guidance on how to do that. But that's so very important. We can't leave it to the Richards and the other people out there that are, at, you know, banging the drum and supporting. This isn't just the 3% making the case for everybody else. Anybody that feels animated by this has a has a has an obligation to, to get out there and help support this as well in any way, shape, or form. Um, we're in the process of pulling some structure together, in in in, in, in the sense of a, of a of an education project that can help accelerate that movement. But I think in a really important way, keep it as a people's movement. Keep keep the keep the um, organic nature of it going. Um, and, and keep and not make it some sort of command ship top down model, but that people can feel empowered in their own way to have the conversation in their own places. So that's where we are with the Ulleri statement. Um, I hope that was a, a useful conversation, and I'm, and I'm really, really happy that I think we've got some time. Yeah, we've got a, a bit of time to take some to, to take some questions.